crying or things going on outside. I might mute myself, but I'll try to remember to unmute myself before I start speaking. But if that ever happens, okay. just start waving frantically at me. Okay. I think I hear some crying right now, actually. Yeah, maybe a little bit. These microphones are too good. Nah. <laughs> you know? It's powerful technology these days. It is. Well, now we have all these, uh, we make all these Skype calls and Google Hangouts with these, like, we all have the buds hanging off of our heads. I feel like it's a new accessory. Yeah, it's true. It's funny looking it's just... at a, a wall of calls and seeing all the... <laughs> I, I've I've debated for a long time, you know, I feel like Bluetooth headsets got a bad rap. Have we talked about this? No. Um, because they're actually really useful. You know, yeah. like instead of having these dangly cables, you just have a little thing here and you can talk. And But the problem is that the first people to use them were the kinds of people who were not the people that other people wanted to emulate. Yeah. So... You know, it was like it, it, it got it got it got off to the wrong foot. You know, the initial crowd was just not the crowd that we wanted it to be. It was uh, all, and, all salesmen all the time. Right. The sales mm -hmm. guys ruined it for the rest of us because Bluetooth headsets are actually quite useful. And, you know, you could you could still I feel like you could try to reclaim it. You know, like I, 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 I I'm debating whether to try to go there. This is what I'm trying to say. True that. Mm hmm. All right, I'm going to post on Twitter again. We are live. Oh yeah, I can see your face on there now. That's great. Oh, yeah. yeah. But how do we know when people are calling in? Is there a way to... Uh... Yeah, that's a great question. Hopefully it's not just you and I talking to one another and waiting that around. Would be hilarious, there are thousands of people just waiting for us. That would suck. Uh, that's actually maybe what's happening. At which point, um, this is gold. So, <laughs> hello, hello, people out there. Hello, world. Yeah, that would be great. That would be really something. Uh, why don't we message some of the folks that we are expecting to join and yeah. see if they're wondering what's going on? I can invite people to the broadcast, which maybe is what I need to do. Yeah. Um, I think we should do that. Okay, if you're watching out there and we are looking like fools, <laughs> email me at tony at nwc.co or tweet me at Tony Be Good. And we'll try to figure out how to add you. That's right. This is going to be great. Yeah. I'm inviting a couple of folks that I know are RSVP'd okay. and whom I know are humans. Okay. Am I able to add? I wonder if I can invite people. Ah, I can. Just invite people that you know. I'm doing it. You know. I think. <laughs> Anyone. Anyone at all. All right. It would be great to have a second computer so I could see what is going on. Uh, here we go. I'm, gonna, I'm also going to add a few people who have RSVP'd. Again, if you're just joining us, we're trying to figure out how to put you on the screen. So you can send either Tony or I a message and we'll be sure to uh, get you on the list here and get you added. Oh, Danny is here. Hi, Danny. I know you're watching. We'll try to get you on screen. I do see a little uh, thing in the corner that says we have one viewer. Two viewers. We have two viewers now. Do I hear three viewers? Oh, now we're down to one. Who 
whoever you are viewer if you I don't know if you can see the chat we just started a chat feature in the sidebar there oh boy <laughs> Technology. Technology uh, is so fun. Danny says, hi, I'm watching. I can't send any messages, but I'm here. He just emailed that to us. Thank you, Danny. Uh, OK, cool. I just invited you, Danny, to be a part of our Hangout. So if you see my invitation and would like to join, then click the link and we'll get you on here. We're hoping to get the faces uh, of some of the folks that we're talking to um, so that this isn't just me and Susan talking to you, but uh, us all talking to each other. So uh, if you're out there, if you are watching uh, and you would like to be a part of the call, please email me, T-O-N-Y at N-W-C dot C-O, and we will get you on the call. Um, in the meantime, what we can do is, uh, Susan, do you wanna do you wanna just start kind of talking about uh, what we've got on our plan and and see if we can get some folks patched in as we go? Sure, that sounds just fine. Okay, great. Well, to our uh, to our viewers who are out there, if you're watching, hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Tony Bacigalupo. Uh, joining me is Susan Dorsch of Office Nomads in Seattle. Um, we together are collaborating on a new program that we run called Cotivation, uh, which is a simple but powerful accountability program for members of co-working communities. Uh, and we'll talk a lot more about that later. Uh, but this conversation is about revitalizing the culture in your community. Uh, if you've run a community for more than even just a few months or even weeks, uh, you know what it is to uh, see a culture in a community be strong and then be not so strong as maybe people come and go or as the energy of the initial growth of the community starts to wane over time. And it can be really hard as a community organizer to um, maintain that energy in a sustainable way. And when I say a sustainable way, um, what we talk about really is how to do the uh, how to do things that keep the energy levels high in your community without everything depending on you. Uh, we, myself and Susan, have a lot of experience building community in a lot of different ways, and we know uh, what it is to try to do things centered on ourselves and uh, and and the burnout that it leads to. So, uh, what we're hoping to cover today. Uh, are some topics around how to, first of all, get a sense of the health of your community, but then also how to um, invigorate your community in ways that doesn't put a long-term load on you. Uh, so what we're hoping to do is to get another couple of folks on the call, uh, other friends of ours, other uh, community organizers who we can talk to about this. Uh, but in the meantime, Susan and I are just going to broadcast and hope that you're out there receiving it. Uh, this is crazy, uh, but uh, I think it's going to be some fun. Uh, Susan, you uh, want to say a few words and introduce yourself? I sure can. Well, and also I just see we got a message from Jesus that he's watching and trying to figure out how to interact. Jesus, we're trying to figure out how to get to you as well. Um, I'm not sure. Tony, did you send Jesus a... Uh, I sure did. An invitation. Um, so if you're watching, you should have gotten an invitation to join us on screen here. Um, we're gonna do our darndest to get you up here. Um, and in the meantime, in those public comments, if you want to um, send us questions or uh, ideas or anything like that, in the meantime, before we can get you on screen, that's a great way for us to be able to find you and talk to you. Sorry, we're kind of learning as we go here. We had tested out this technology earlier, but this is not a expected hiccup. Anyway. Um, in forms of introductions, I'm Susan Dorsch. Uh, I co-founded Office Nomads. We're in Seattle, Washington um, in 2007. Um, and I also uh, have had a lot of ups and downs when it comes to community organizing, um, have a good bit of experience. Um, and it's kind of come together in this most recent iteration, working with Tony, um, launching our Cotivation program, which is one of many tools that have been successful for me in the past in, in helping revitalize and, and sort of re-infuse um, Office Nomads with a little shot of culture. So um, 
yeah, I'm just really excited to be here. I'm really excited for this sort of next phase, um, what, which is what it feels like for me in the world of co-working. I feel like for many years, it was a lot of us trying to get spaces and communities up and running and figuring out all the um, all the little hiccups along the way and, and learning a lot of things. And this next phase really feels like sort of the, the, the next level of that, which is really honing in even more than we did before on, on community building, community outreach, and specifically how to make sure that our communities survive and thrive without being wholly reliant on the one or two people who maybe got things started at the beginning. Um, seen a lot of co-working spaces struggle when they uh, realize that they're wholly dependent on one uh, co-founder, on one community manager, on one person kind of keeping things going. And um, that has definitely been a recipe for watching um, some co-working spaces struggle. Um, so anyway, uh, we're really excited to talk to you about that and to hear your questions. Um, I think we've got Jesus joining us, which I'm really excited about. We figured out how to get another person on screen. That's right. We've also got uh, Katie joining us. I just got a message from Katie, who uh, uh, was has been watching, and now we are connected, and now I've invited her to join the call, so hopefully we can get her online as well. Um, so just as we sort of start to get these folks online, one of the things I wanted to add, uh, for those of you who uh, might not know Susan and I uh, that well, um, we are both folks who founded or co-founded co-working spaces back in uh, 2007, 2008, uh, and uh, basically have been uh, you know, running co-working spaces for a long time. I actually just closed up my space in New York uh, just over a month ago, um, but we've both had a lot of experience sort of building a co-working space, being really eyeball deep in it, but then also having to figure out how to step away from it. Uh, and over the course of time, you know, you can't necessarily always be the person who's always there, and so um, it's something that is relevant uh, to us. Currently, Susan uh, is, you know, figuring out how to uh, manage her community in a way without it relying on her being there uh, all the time and uh, you know that's something that uh, I had to learn as well over the course of the last few years at Newark City uh, so um, what we're hoping is uh, we can get a couple of uh, you guys on board and we can find out more about the communities that you're building and your questions and needs but in the meantime I think we're gonna start just kinda of running through some of the things we wanted to talk about Susan. You want me to get started? Why don't you kick us off? Okay. Um, I would say with a, two things happened to us right um, at an inflection point for Office Nomads, which was at a time when we um, expanded. Oh, hey, Danny. Hey, yo. Uh, when we expanded into our first floor of our space. So in uh, 2012, we doubled the size of our space at Office Nomads. Um, and that was a big change for us, not just um, kind of physically, uh, operationally for us to manage, but it was also a huge community shift. Um, of course, conveniently at the time that we doubled our size, we, uh, for uh, just happenstance, lost a pretty large chunk of members at the same time, so we were in panic phase. Um, and. We did two, we, well, we did a lot of things, but two things that were really successful in that experience um, that I thought are worth sharing for those of you who are out there um, trying to build a space or get a community started. Um, and the, the first one was we started a program that we call the Community Cultivator Program at Office Nomads. Um, lots of other spaces do similar things, um, calling them like a working membership programs, things like that really started to reach and start to rely upon our members to help us run the space. Um, we wanted to give them a stronger sense of ownership. They were always looking for new ways to get involved. And um, I think in the past maybe we hadn't let them enough. Um, and so because of the physical expansion, we actually needed more hands to rely on um, and more eyes on the space because it was twice as much. Um, and so we started with a group of five members um, that we did a trade for membership with that really just helped sit with us um, at the front of our co-working space and help us get things going, help um, take members on tour, new potential members on tours, um, answer the phone, 
run little programs throughout the space, anything that they really wanted to do that helped them feel like they were cultivating the community at Office Nomads. Um, and that program was really successful. It took us a little while to get started. I'm really happy to um, uh, answer questions about how to get that up and running. Um, but that was was and has been really successful and a, and a critical component for us at Office Nomads. Um, uh, a, a saying that we tend to rely on a lot within our space is that people support what they help to create um, and it had taken us a little while to um, figure out even more ways to put that mantra into practice um, and this was one really significant way. Um, and the other, the second piece that uh, got rolling in was really I think pretty successful from a, a culture and community standpoint at Office Nomads was um, getting Cotivation up and running. Um, which is just a group accountability meeting um, uh, that we would run for uh, five to six weeks. We kind of played around with the ideas, but I would gotten this idea um, from Tony. He and I were talking, and I was feeling disconnected from my members at the time and was struggling a little bit. Um, and Cotivation as a program really helps me reconnect with a small group of members, build sort of uh, a, a little, just a, a little sub-community, even just for myself as a, as a co-founder. Um, and it was pretty amazing. So those two things I would say were really helpful tools that um, I have come to rely upon a lot um, when it comes to kind of just continuing to work on the culture of a community space. Um, it is work that is never done, uh, which I find really rewarding. Um, so yeah, I'm going to end my little rant <laughs> there about the things that I um, have worked on but they've, that have been really valuable. So, Susan, I want to build on something that you were just talking about, which is uh, sub-communities, and I think that that's a huge, huge part of what it is to be revitalizing a community. Um, when we got started at New York City uh, with Cotivation, uh, one of the issues that I had, one of the reasons that I got started with it was that um, I knew that I couldn't get the people in my space to want to talk to each other just by forcing them to do it. Uh, you know, I, I looked around at a room full of people that weren't talking to each other and I realized that I wasn't going to just be able to get them to change their behavior and that the behavior had to get changed from some kind of sort of fresh approach. And so the idea with Cotivation was time it in such a way that we could line it up with when new members were going to join, which was in January when we know a lot of new folks join, and draw some of the people out of the current community who were maybe waiting for an opportunity to re-engage in a better way. And so what we ended up having was about 12 or 13 or so people that were a mix of brand new members and a mix of existing members who were ready to sort of start a new community from within. And in doing so, what we had was a chance to kind of create a new cultural dynamic from within the co-working space while we were doing it. Uh, and so instead of trying to say, okay, I've got this 150 people and I have to get them all talking to each other differently than they are today, I can simply say, okay, I just want to find the 10 or 15 people who want to interact in a new way and let's get those people together and set up some new rules and some new, you know, sort of cultural dynamics around that. And then, um, and then let that culture take hold and let that sort of pervade into future generations of, of members as they sort of started to come into the space. And, uh, and it went really, really well. Those first people who joined that initial Cotivation group ended up becoming the cultural core of the space. Those people were the ones who were producing the events and hosting the happy hours and getting to know new members, you know, voluntarily. And they were highly active people. And the culture that they sort of developed amongst each other uh, really helped to um, carry the culture of the rest of the space along with it. And so we ended up kind of reinventing the culture of our community from within. Uh, just by starting with a small group of people who were up for it. Uh, and that's really what it came down to and where we found so much value in that. Um, now, you know, Susan and I produce this new program, uh, you know, where we're, where we're teaching other people how to do cultivation groups. And so, you know, we offer training, we offer procedures. Uh, Susan actually took this idea that I had and, and made an actual robust program around it. So we now have 
an actual guide for you know how people can set this up. So part of why we're doing this is to make people more aware of you know what we have to offer, so that if you guys want to um, start a cotivation group or something similar to it, then you can talk to us about that and maybe join our training program in August. Uh, but we're not just here to sell you on that. Part of what we want to uh, share in this conversation is how you can approach reinvigorating your community from within. And so if you can look at this basic model of taking a community you have and then rebuilding a new community from within using whatever approach that works for you, um, you might be able to find a great way to sort of um, reinvigorate things and, and end up in a stronger place. And so uh, that's sort of what the, the general overview is of that. Uh, and we've got a few other things we want to dive into, but uh, Susan, do you think maybe we could try to patch in one of our callers and, and, uh, and see if we can learn a little bit about uh, who we have on the line? Oh, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry, I would love that. <laughs> okay. Danny, I see that you've got your, you, you look like you're coming through great on video. I'm wondering if maybe, would you be up for talking to us a little bit about uh, your situation right now and, uh, and maybe tell us a little bit about why you're on the call? Hey, uh, Tony, the, can you hear me okay? You can, great. Um, so I do apologize. It, uh, both of you um, said a few things and I lost the, the chat a couple times. Um, <clears throat> but what I did, one of the, the bigger things that I caught was just that um, you had been talking about um, trying to get your community so that all the members are not relying on you or one of, uh, one of the, the people who work at the co-working space um, to kind of develop the community. Um, so that, you know, that's been a challenge for us. We're in um, Asbury Park, New Jersey, and when we started uh, CoWorks, the space here, uh, five years ago, uh, the, the idea was pretty, um, you know, not, not really uh, common around here. So uh, Brett and I did a lot of work to try to get people, um, number one, just to come into the space, but then, um, you know, when we found out that no one was coming to the space, uh, we had to do a lot of work, um, uh, you know, to create ways for people to talk to each other. The, the first thing that, that happened was we created um, Jersey Shore Tech, which is a meetup down here. Um, it started as a drink up, and it, you know, evolved into like a, a larger meetup group that, you know, now um, people, um, it's pr primarily speakers, um, you know, come to that group. But that took, that took a long, long time. And even that, it was, uh, it was still us facilitating it. So, um, you know, big turning point for us was when we were able to move into to our second space which is our current space, and uh, what we had to do um, was was create some uh, permanent, you know, permanent space for some members. Um, and when that happened, that really helped out because uh, you know one of the things about people meeting each other and, and getting to know each other is it does take time. You know, a lot of people will come in here, um, and they will literally hang out for you know, a week or so and not really talk to anybody, um, which, you know, is even my own problem. Like, if I go someplace, you know, I'm, I'm a shy person, so um, I don't get right into it with everybody. So um, that can really be a deterrent, you know, with, with, with new members. And um, there's really, it's really tough to kind of just make that happen. It's, it's definitely something that has to be organic and, a lot of things can come into play, like when somebody comes here for the first time. It really can sometimes depend on who is here. Um, you know, certainly how many people are here, but but who is here has a has a you know big you know big effect on it. Um, some people are lucky enough to just hear a conversation going on around them, and there's something that's completely interesting to them, and you know they're able to to jump in, and that and that's how they meet people. But it is it is it is very difficult um, to you know let people within the in the community 
um, kind of do it themselves rather than, than us trying to make everything happen. But when it does happen, and it, it does happen sometimes, it's, it's really an awesome thing because we do have like little subgroups here, people that, you know, kind of, they just, uh, you know, they got their, you know, they usually will sit next to, to one another and then, you know, they, they often, you know, so, some people even have uh, created like companies here. Um, or have at least traded off work with one another. So those are like the success stories, and it, it would be awesome to see more of them happen. Oh, Tony, I think I you're muted. Myself. Yeah, uh, Danny, do you have a sense of what the uh, with the biggest success stories? what it was that allowed for those success stories to happen. I mean, it sounded like there was obviously some serendipity, so just some coincidental sort of people getting to know each other in the space. Do you have a sense of there being any um, anything you could draw from that that could really be sort of, you know, reproduced or designed for? So so here, um, our, right now our space is, is kind of developer-heavy, I'd say like half the people who are here are, you know, all fit into that category where they're, you know, they're they're doing um, software development work, and a lot of a lot of people here are doing client work. So it's not so much that um, developers are working on their own startups. A lot of them are, um, you know, working on stuff for other clients. So the the, the best stories are or when people actually need help on a project. Um, you know, there's an example. There was there was something that was built for a client. Um, it failed, but it was it was called uh, Crumble Me, which was kind of like kind of like a Snapchat uh, type app. And uh, three of the guys here, uh, you know, one guy got the job and realized that it was way too big for him. And you know, he ended up um, hiring out you know, within the within the co-working space. So three guys all worked on the job together. Um, and, you know, situations like that where people are getting paid to do the work um, and, you know, they like people have found something to work on together, like, you know, over months, like really creates a bond there. So, so that type of thing, that's like the biggest version of it, but that type of thing seems to happen a lot. Where people who are doing development work, um, you know, find that they they'll need some somebody else to actually uh, help them with it, and they usually, um, you know, because there are a lot of people doing development work, they usually will hire uh, somebody within this space. Um, you know, I've also seen some some things where people have work have come up with like their own startup projects and stuff, but. Being that um, a lot of those situations, people are usually doing some other job, and they might not be in here a lot. You know, maybe they can only come in one day a week, like it's their work from home day, and then they got to work on their other stuff anyway. So, um, I hope that kind of describes it for you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, it's cool to see it happening. It's amazing because every co-working space. Everywhere has so many of the same stories, you know, and uh, through no central coordination at all. It's just it's amazing. Uh, but um, what I'm wondering, I guess, is now in terms of where your community is at, uh, what do you think that it most needs right now, or what would you most like to see? What's what? What are you sort of hankering for? I think at this point, you know, what what I, I think what Brett and I most need is, is just more um, more people showing up and giving us feedback. Um, like I said, like we, we started off being kind of developer heavy and we still are, but uh, more and more people are starting to come here um, that are just interested in the space and, and you know, interested in working in a co-working space. Um, so it's really tough to catch, you know, what's going on like you know what what somebody thinks of the space, um, you know they may not talk to anybody else about it. Um, so as far as like you know the hope that other small like you know little sub communities like build inside of the community, 
I think that that you know that's just having the conversation, having you know some type of dialogue that's not so much like, hey, can we all have a you know a meeting and like talk about these things? Like you know, just having people people like really use um, the space and and use the concept, um, you know, is a big thing. Um, and like I said, it, it is tough because you know we get people coming in. And then you know they might come here for a little while. They don't don't necessarily find what they were looking for, and they they bolt. You know. Sure. Yeah, Danny, that sounds really common for sure. Um, I think amongst a lot of co-working spaces. One just to I don't know give you some ideas. Like one um, one thing we try to tell all of our members at Office Nomads and kind of communicate that is not their responsibility necessarily, but as an invitation for them as members. As we sort of say, you know, if somebody comes in and it's their first day and they've never been here and they kind of come in, put on their headphones, put their head down, get to work, and then leave and nobody has actually said anything to them all day, like, we've missed a really great opportunity because they probably came here for many reasons, but one of which is to be around and kind of be around other people. Um, and so we, I, I think that it's important to not take that um, that issue as just your own, you know, as the co-working space operator and the owner, but is to say, hey, if this is a thing that we're all doing together as a group, even if we have sub-communities and sort of, you know, kind of smaller clusters of, of culture throughout the space, it's really important that we all kind of feel a little bit of obligation to making sure that people don't totally slip in under the radar and have just no contact with another person. Um, and another sort of element of that though is that you know like you said like you might go into a space and do that maybe on the first day because you're a little shy I, I might do well no that's not true I think I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of a chatter but um, you know I, I, there are some people that it takes some time you said maybe a week like we've had some members sit quietly for almost you know three or four months before they really kind of come out and are and are more comfortable um, with talking with other people um, so also seeding several places, just opportunities and invitations. So lots of co-working spaces will, um, you know, offer or invite their new members, be like, hey, introduce yourself on our, you know, on our uh, member email list, if that's something that you might like to do. You never know, there's probably somebody else in here who you might have a connection with that you didn't realize. Um, or... Um, Another uh, tool that we've used now in our space is, um, as a part of sort of our new member operations uh, stuff is that we'll have a new member come in and when they sign up as a new member then we do a, a sh just a short kind of conversation with them to ask them what they're, what they're up to, what brought them here, what they're interested in so it's not just about work. You know, it's like, well, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are you into? Like, what do you like? <laughs> mm -hmm. Is one of our questions that we ask. Um, and that can be another, just another little opportunity. No, no one person is going to have all of those things work really well for. But if you can give them, you know, four or five different places where they might be able to jump in where they feel good, then you're more likely to have those people come back. Because, um, yeah. again, if they just show up and head down and then they walk out again, they're going to be like, well, I can do that at a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and not that people are necessarily comparing that experience, but... It definitely makes a difference when somebody even just says hi to them in the kitchen. And that's something that, you know, members, that's where you get to empower your members is to be like, hey, if you're getting coffee at the same time as this other person who you don't know and you've been around for a while, say hello. That's yeah. pretty easy. Like, it's so easy. Yeah. We had one that's member cool. get frustrated after several years. She was like, you know, I just feel like I don't know anyone in the space anymore. And another member turned to her and was like, well, when was the last time you introduced yourself to anybody? Um, and so just a, a reminder to members to do that can be really empowering. And again, it's it's their job too, not just yours. Hey, folks, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, hey, it's Jesus. Hey. <laughs> um, I, know Tony, I know Tony for a while. Um, so I just wanted to chime in. You know, I think that one of the, um, you know, I was a member at uh, uh, Newark City. Um, but the place was uh, absolutely great. Um, I took an, uh, an I took advantage of uh, an opportunity that presented itself, so I had to leave. Um, but I always figured that it was the kind of place that I would, you know, eventually wind up at um, sometime in the future, right? In fact, 
I remember uh, Tony had a ceremony where he handed out keys to people who had uh, been uh, members for, for quite a while and participated in um, lots of activities there. Um, and I had held on to my keys, and um, after after having left for about two months, I was like, you know, I got to give these keys back. And I approached uh, Peter. He said, um, he said, why don't you just hold on to it? Right? So in the back of my head, I mean, I must think of it like at least once a week. You know, I'm like, I got those keys. I'm gonna go back. There, you know, <laughs> um, get a little bit out of corporate America. But anyway, um, I think that one of the biggest challenges is that um, you that you we can experience what's what I consider like the commuter college experience, right? People mm -hmm. go in, they do their stuff, and they leave, right? As opposed to like a campus where you have a real you know campus life, right? So you know, and I think that that's a that's a real challenge. I don't claim to have the answer, but um, I think that that's you know one of the identifiable challenges. Right? One of the things that I think um, we could do is uh, is to take advantage of downtime. Now, you know, um, there's a lot of efficiency in, in people who are co-working, so downtime is used for getting more work done, right? But um, if somehow they can be motivated to, to you know, maybe, maybe you get a pizza and you, you know, instead of eight slices, you make it 64 slices or whatever, mm -hmm. just so that people gather around some table and, you know, have finger food and have an opportunity to talk. And the, the requirement is that you can't eat it at the table. In fact, I remember um, that requirement coming up several times at uh, at New York City. That if we'd have lunch, it was like, yeah, but you guys have to eat over there in the public space, right? And I mm -hmm. I always thought that that was kind of like a a motivator towards uh, interacting. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that maybe that's that's the key. Those are those are the key challenges, right? It's like introduce some downtime and get people to you know not use that down that downtime to go back to their desk and and kind of uh, um, isolate themselves uh, while eating pizza, uh, but um, but get them to interact at that point. Um, and the other thing, I the one one other thing I wanted to mention was, um, and um, I, I didn't get your name, the person who spoke before, but you mentioned the fact that you're developer heavy. You know, when you when you have, I, I'm a developer. I work with developers today. Um, I don't. I think I probably if I added up how much time I speak socially to someone during the day, it'd probably be like 20 minutes out of a, it's an eight to nine hour day, right? Because we are in our heads and we're in our code, right? Um, it would, I think when you introduce other, um, other fields, right, maybe like more creative aspects, so now you mix it up, right? It's technology and maybe you have, you know, designers or clothing designers or artists or whatever it is. Um, I think you get a more dynamic environment Never knowing what's going to happen, things like that, and it becomes, at least for me, it become more pleasant to see. Right? Uh, I think the developers tend to be uh, kind of like in their heads, so that's just another challenge that I I see. Yeah, well, hopefully the increased diversity in Danny's community. Uh, his name is Danny from CoWorks in New Jersey. Hey, hey Zeus, uh, you're in New Jersey too, aren't you? No. Yes, I'm in New Jersey. Yep. Cool. Well, but Danny. I'm working in uh, Brooklyn right now. Okay. Well, Denny is in Asbury Park, so... Uh, yeah, I heard of the space. Yeah. yeah, Asbury Park is about 50 minutes away from me, and Asbury Park is great, and I also, I've also heard of the space. I, I wanted to check it out, actually, at one point. Um, not because I could, it would work for me, but just because I was excited to see another co-working space, and in my head, I imagined it to be, uh, you know, just a cool place, you know, you, you're right on the beach. You got a real nice community there. The location is off that lake, right? Is that right, Danny? Yeah, we're on on Lake Avenue, um, just yeah. uh, three blocks from the beach. Yeah. Okay, so so real quick, I want to try to just chime in with a couple of things that I thought of while you guys were talking, um, and and Susan as well. Um, First of all, re-emphasizing the importance of giving people different ways to connect. Uh, it took me years to get the hang of this fact, but recognizing that people interact differently. Everyone has their own way of interacting with their community. Uh, so account for the fact that maybe some people are only ever going to want to introduce themselves and get to know people online through your online discussion group. Um, 
some people are going to be, you know, natural socialites. They're going to want that opportunity to talk in the kitchen, things like that. Um, and some people are going to need an invitation. And so one program we ran at New York City that was very successful uh, for the past year or so was uh, a welcome aboard member meeting. And it was our way of not forcing people to talk to each other, but at least creating an invitation to say, if you're new here, if you don't really know anyone, this is a chance to come into a room where there will be other people there who are also new, uh, but maybe not just people who are new, people who have been around for a while who we're also inviting to join. And so it was a great way for everybody to know somebody. And that was sort of the way that we pitched it, was to say, hey, this is a chance, you know, this is one hour once a month where, you know, we want to make sure that everyone here has a chance to know someone here. And uh, that was uh, super, super successful. It was a lot of fun and uh, helped us to make sure that nobody slipped through the cracks. Um, one of the activities we did that was attached to that was that we actually talked about who was in the space, who were the members there. Um, when I say we, I mean me and my team, that we actually printed out the list of all of our members and went through all of it and said, you know, who here needs to be reengaged? Who here is someone who joined and maybe we don't really know what their situation is? Um, identified those people and gave them a little extra love. And maybe we messaged them personally or maybe we sent uh, a mail merge to 20 or 30 people at a time. Uh, but we, we kind of made sure that we were always looking out for those people that needed that little extra boost. Uh, and that was hugely helpful for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously we had the Cotivation group and we were always looking for ways to engage with people. Uh, one of the things, Danny, that you mentioned that I thought was great was, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, was it uh, Jesus? Jesus, you talked about downtime, introducing downtime. And um, Danny, I think you, you told stories of how that, that happened in your space. Uh, I, I, I have one really great story from New York City about that. Uh, there was actually from our Kickstarter campaign, uh, when we got started, there were there was a, a, a contribution level that got you um, a special co-working day in the space. And so you would be like the mayor for a day in the space. And, uh, and so one of our contributors uh, took us up on it, and what we did was we had a, a peanut butter and jelly panini brunch uh, on a Friday. And so we got out these panini grills and we got a bunch of bread and different kinds of jams and jellies and whatever and just said, okay, you know, 1230, everybody line up and, and make your PBJ, right? And uh, what was so great about it was that we didn't have enough panini grills to be able to make the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches quickly. And so we ended up having a huge line of basically everyone in the space standing in line waiting for their food. And it was, I cannot tell you how amazing it was. We went from a space that was, you could hear a pin drop silent, everyone working on their computers, to once they're standing online, everyone online was talking to each other. And I saw people introducing themselves to each other, like hands getting shaken, people laughing, like, it was crazy. Uh, and these were, these were people who were, a lot of them that were members there for a long time. And I, was, I saw people meeting each other. And I was like, how did you guys not know each other yet, you know? But it was that creating that little moment of downtime that gave people a way to be away from their damn screens uh, and be in a place where they had nothing else to do but stand around and wait and talk to each other. And it ended up being probably the most culturally valuable thing we had done in months uh, and all it was was a couple of PBJs. I mean, we probably spent, you know, a hundred bucks on on uh, groceries, if even that. Uh, and it ended up being this incredible experience. So, uh, plus one for creating downtime and creating those little opportunities. Sometimes it's so easy to get your head stuck in. You know, I need to create these big programs or these big events or something really deep and complicated. And sometimes you just need to make some some paninis. For us, it was waffles. Great. Great. You know, <laughs> I, I have to chime in because um, I spoke to someone, this was years back, um, and I had just gotten um, what was called Peapod. I think Peapod still exists, where you can order your food um, from the supermarket, have it delivered to your house, and, you know, and that's it. You're done, right? You don't have to go shopping. It comes right to you. So I show this guy, an older gentleman. He's from Iran, and, and I show him, I'm like, you know, hey, I have this, this thing, and I just order my food, I get home, and my food is right there, and it's, and it's great. And he says, you know, and I said, don't you think it's great? He goes, 
yeah, it's great. And he, and he says to me, and I said to him, uh, do you like it? And he's like, no. And I said, why? And he says, well, in Iran, we used to have to get online to wait for food. Um, and yeah, everybody hated the lines. But when you go online, you, um, you meet your friends, you meet new friends, you talk about what's wrong and all these things. So, you know, there's that downtime, right? And, and it's, it's almost like, you know, I, was, I also compare it to people who get stuck in an elevator that live in a building that they've, always, they've lived in for many years, right? They get stuck in this elevator and they, they're forced to talk to the people who are in the elevator. And they always come out of there like, you know, oh, we should get together sometime, right? When they've always been in there, right? It's, it's that downtime um, phenomenon again. But, yeah, interesting story, Tony. Yeah, and the, and, the uh, down, downtime plus food is, like, amazing. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe there are people who want to um, uh, promote their food business. Um, you know, maybe they can be invited in from time to time to, to a co-working space and let people line up. Let them line up for the food. So uh, I, I've got a, uh, a chat question coming in, uh, and I think now is an appropriate time. We've still got a little time left. Uh, this is from Katie Wall Vatney, uh, who is with ThinkSpace in Redmond, and uh, K Katie is writing in to ask, uh, and I'll read her question to you guys. Uh, have you ever done any studies on how cultivation can affect spaces that only have private offices? Our headquarters has 90 private offices, and I would love to start a group that got more people involved in our community. Any suggestions? Also, we do have another location that does have co-working, and the people seem to really want to be heads down getting work done, so learning how to implement this stuff is awesome. Katie, thank you for chiming in. I hope you're still watching, uh, and I appreciate the question. Susan, I saw you smile. Uh, do you know Katie? I, I, it seemed like you were psyched for this question. I definitely, oh, I, I must have met Katie. Maybe I did, but I definitely know ThinkSpace, so I've known Peter, the co-founder there, for a long time. They're out here, so I'm in Seattle. Redmond is uh, one of the suburbs close to us, and they open a new space in Fremont, which is in Seattle. So, me and Think Space go way back. Great. So, Susan, what do you think? Is cultivation possible in a place where either it's all private offices or the people are just on their headphones and they're not really talking to each other? Totally. Um, I think that um, you know the, the the challenge of private offices is one that we've heard from you know kind of the the day the infancy days with co working. Um, is sort of whether or not private offices kind of help or hinder the process. Um, they're definitely, uh, for those of us who are space operators, more um, financially um, successful than the co-working model from time to time. People discover that. Um, but I think that, you know, there's a lot of similarities um, between trying to get a, a room full of people who all have their heads down and headphones in to 30 like little rooms of people all doing the same thing. Um, the, the idea is simple. It's, it's how do you um, just start uh, infusing a little bit of, of community within those spaces that might not feel like they have a lot going on right now. Um, and, and really what it takes is just getting to know a small group of people. Um, from the first time I kind of <laughs> tried to run Cotivation when I didn't really know what I was thinking about or talking about when we were kind of developing the program, um, the biggest success, I would say, from that first meeting to now where we're running our 14th Cotivation series at Office Nomads right now, um, the, the biggest win of the whole thing is members saying, hey, it's really great that now I know eight or nine or even just three. Like, I know these people now, and I know them in a, in a a much more specific way than I knew them before. I know what their struggles are. I know what they're working on. Um, I know that they're trying to floss more, whatever you know, whatever it might be. Um, that it, it creates that bond of a shared experience. I think that um, whether you have walls or not, um, I think it makes a difference um, because it means that whether you see each other in the elevator of of your building or whether you run across one another in the kitchen, you're even more likely to say hello and catch up than you were before or to shoot one another an email and say, hey, I remember you were working on this thing. I just ran across something that you might find useful. Um, so I, I would definitely say that Cotivation could be helpful in that way, um, as could you know, other programs. You know, Cotivation is just the one that's really worked for us, but um, there's ways that you can infuse a sense or at least get that started 
a sense of community amongst a small group because um, it's a pretty intimidating thing to try and say, all right, now I've got, you know, 100 members and I want them all to be friends. <laughs> um, that's a much bigger challenge to try and face than, hey, I want seven people to get to know one another is a much simpler place to start. So uh, we have a wonderful friend, Ray Lindenberg, who runs a uh, workspace, and it's really not a co-working space. It's a it's a massive suite. It's it's all suites. It's called SOS uh, and Select Office Suites, and it's all private offices. And there's very little congregation area. There's some, but there there there's not a lot. Um, but he has a incredible community. Like they have crazy parties. They uh, I've walked around with him in his space. And he, he knows everyone there. Uh, I feel like he must speak a few words of at least five or six different languages. So, I mean, when he's just going around, he's just talking to everyone. Um, and it, it was the first time walking around with him a few years back that I found that it is possible to have a great community, even in a space that's not designed to be super social. Um, and that comes down to a few different things that you can do, right? Everything that Susan talked about. Uh, and and in particular, in, in my mind, what I see is maybe just zeroing in on a few people. Like you, as someone who works there, um, you know who's there. Maybe you don't know everyone there, but you know a lot of the people that are there. And uh, maybe you know of a few people where there's a, there's, there's a little bit of a pulse of, of possibility that there could be some participation, that there could be some activity there. Um, get to know them. You know, and don't necessarily think in terms of everybody, but maybe if you could just have a nice conversation with one or two people at a time, um, get to know, you know, not even work-related, what their story is, why they're there, what's going on in their lives, what do they care about, and look for opportunities to empower those people to use your space as a community center to help them. Um, really, if you just if you just find one person who's up for that, and they can set an example for other people, then that's going to be a huge start, you know, that maybe is a snowball that rolls down a hill and gets other people uh, out of their offices and, and sort of really talking to each other. Um, the other thing is, uh, gosh, what was the other thing? I had another thing, and it was really good. Uh, <laughs> um, Oh, new, new generations. So I just wrote a blog post about this. New generations of people coming in. Uh, so right now you have a culture of people that aren't seeing that your space has an expectation of being social or, or connecting to the other members as being a part of what it is to be a member there. But you have a chance to change that expectation with every new member that joins. Uh, and so when a new person joins, or when a person leaves and a new person replaces them, that person is a clean slate, and how they interact with your space is something that is something that you can shape. And so, generationally, over the course of time, if you're putting effort into creating different expectations for the people who are joining later on, um, over the course of time, that culture will start to pervade as older members leave and newer members come in. Um, the new members will see the members that you have instilled with these new expectations and their expectations will be shifted and so on. Uh, and part of why we love Cotivation so much is that it gives us a very specific program to uh, attract people who are open to that new expectation. So when, um, when I started at my Cotivation group and it was, I was advertising at the end of December and we were preparing for the January rush because we get a lot of new members in January, and this is totally appropriate to Labor Day, which is coming up too, um, we could say, hey, are you interested in our co-working space? If so, this is a really great day to join because we're starting a new group. It's all about goal setting. It's all about helping each other out. And maybe if you're a little intimidated because you don't know anyone in our community, uh, this is a great chance because there's going to be other people there who are new. And this is going to be a chance for you to come in at a time when there are other new people and you won't necessarily feel like the only one who doesn't know everybody here. Uh, and by the way, it starts on this date. So if you're someone who could come in and join any time, this gives you a very specific date to say, okay, this is the time I should come in because I could join whenever I want, but if I come in at this time, I'm going to have this extra program that doesn't cost anything extra and uh, you know, this could really be valuable to me. 
And so, um, again, it doesn't have to be Cotivation, but that's what Susan and I, you know, uh, did and what worked for us. And so, you know, if any of you guys who are listening out there uh, are interested, we've got the next training coming up. We've got these things. Uh, you know, we've got our organizer's guide. And so we're happy to talk to any of you about it uh, as well. And actually, I'll pop our contact information into the chat so we can talk about that. Um, I have to get our plug in, right? Uh, so if you guys are interested in that, of course, talk to us. Um, I want to give um, Eliza, if you're still there and listening, I'd love to hear. Um, I know Eliza's here from Hing Hey Coworks, which is here in Seattle. I don't, Eliza, do you want to say hi and say anything? No pressure if you're there. I think you're there. Maybe not. I just wanted to give her the chance to let us know if there was any questions that she might have. Sure, yeah. We've just got a few minutes left until we hit the end of the hour. It's always funny doing these things because um, it's like, well, what time is it? Okay, well, it's it's 1 o'clock Mountain Time where I am. It's 12 where Susan is and uh, I guess 3 o'clock in Eastern Time, or coming up on uh, 3 o'clock Eastern Time. So uh, I guess, you know, five minutes left till the top of the hour. Uh, so if, Eliza, you want to chime in, uh, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, if Danny or uh, Jesus, if you have any questions uh, or any other parting shots before we close this out. Uh, Katie, I've also got you on chat if you want to chat me on anything. Uh, any last-minute thoughts or, or reactions from everything that we just discussed? Oh, hey, okay, we've got uh, Eliza is chiming in with a chat question. That's great. We are all waiting with bated breath. I was in, <laughs> uh, I had a radio show in college, and so I learned a little bit about how to fill dead air because we had these certain station breaks that would be broadcast from somewhere else, and so you had to time your music so that it would end before the broadcast would start, but then you would have some awkward amount of time. That might be five seconds, it might be a minute and five seconds, and you couldn't have silence, so you just had to figure out how to, you know, stretch it out and fill the dead air until the station thing came in, and you would see on the clock, okay, you know, there's five seconds left, and now it's time for the NPR news brief, and the music would come in, you know, dun, 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 and the music would come in. Um, and sometimes it was easier than others to make it, <laughs> to mask what you were doing. Oh, and now our question has come in from Eliza. Susan, you want to read it for us? Yeah, so we're a new co-working space. What would you suggest would be the best way to start off people in the right mentality to work collaboratively instead of individually? It's a great question. Anybody have any awesome. uh, quick thoughts? I can always riff on this, but... Yeah, I mean, you know, I think... So ju just immediate reaction, um, talk to them, right? Like uh, Individually talk to them, of course, uh, but maybe create opportunities that can draw them out uh, to give them a chance to talk to each other. Um, and dig into the why, right? Like everyone in your space is someone who has something that they're trying to do that they don't know everything about how they're going to do it, right? Nobody's perfect. Everyone has a vulnerability. And if you can get people to share why they're joining, other than I need a place to work, right? Like what, what else is it about their lives, what they're trying to do, what their ambitions are, uh, what are the blanks that need filling in, you know? And uh, get them to open up a little bit about that. Because if someone says, hey, I've got this thing I'm trying to figure out, and someone else says, hey, I can help you with that, boom, you're, you're off to the races, right? Um, and really just trying to uh, always be looking out for opportunities to empower people to use your space as a venue for them to connect to each other. So if there's any way that your space can be a place that can be helpful for them, whether that's by hosting a meetup or having a little lunch session or whatever it is, um, the more that you're able to get people to think about, hey, this isn't just a place to work, this is a gathering space, this is an education space, this is a training space, this is a, a place that I can go to enrich myself and connect to people and not just be um, sitting at my laptop. Um, the more that you can sort of be doing that in the course of conversation, the better. I would also you know, add... I was gonna, uh, oh, go ahead, Jesus. Uh, no, I was going to say that um, uh, one of the things that I found out... Um, much later on, pretty much after leaving New York City, and 
you know, I was a I was a consultant, so I was working independently. Um, New York City provided a great place for me to meet people, um, not be working in my house all the time, and so forth. But later on, I found out that a lot of the challenges that I had, other people had challenges, right? So, you know, how do you keep the pipeline of work coming? Um, how do you how do you price your product, your service? Um, so it turns out that you know that's a very common. Problem and um, kind of are laid out all you know the the um, the ways to to tackle those those questions right to to take on those questions because I, I guess it can be the kind of thing that you kind of solve once and then you have a mechanism in place and people can you know now you're a resource besides to see um, a space uh, you know with the uh, with the community and so forth but you're also a a resource um, I think that that would that would also be, you know, be a great thing, right? Like, if I have a question, I'm starting up this business. Um, how do I keep this going? Oh my God, I got to do taxes. Uh, you know, all these things. Those would be nice things to, to kind of have a uh, a place to to go for the answers. Yeah, I think that there's um, there's ways to work around it, both from a programmatic side, but also just from an opportunity side, like you're talking about, Jesus. I feel like, you know, having a member uh, email list or a way for members to be in touch with one another even if they're not in the space, it's important that they have a, a portal through which they can reach out and ask for help um, and are encouraged to do that. So you can you can also lead with that if there's something that you're having issues with. We've definitely done that at Office Nomads when we're setting up our, you know, we've got our own business as well. It's like, hey, does anybody know a so-and-so? Or we're having issues with this MailChimp integration. Does anybody know how to help with that? You know, asking, starting to uh, take a leadership position and asking for help through that portal is a really great way to get started. Um, and having um, having that downtime that we were talking about before so that members can kind of talk to one another about what they're, what they're doing and what they're going through is another really great opportunity. Um, and then from a programmatic side, um, there's obviously opportunities like, like Cotivation, but um, we've had little fun events. I remember, actually, this is another one that we riffed off of Tony many years ago, was doing like beers and bookkeeping, right? Yeah. Like, all of the all of the people who are working in the space need to kind of keep up books in one shape or another, whether they're their own personal books or it's the business that they're working on. Um, you know, doing little events like that, um, getting ready for tax season, um, having a marketing hour, um, you know, whatever that is, just giving people a little seed that they can um, gather around because you know, they could all be software developers, right? You could have a, what you think is a homogenous sort of group of people, but, um, you know, they're all going to have different different issues that they're tackling, and, and there is sort of diversity within that that I think is important to address. Um, but, yeah, another, another recommendation would be to kind of continue to cultivate a diverse co-working environment um, because then you have even more opportunities to ask for help in a, in a million different ways, whether that's, you know, what neighborhood should I move to, what, you know, developing language should I, you know, write my new program in or whatever, um, that there's, as, if there's somebody out there who can provide an answer, your community is going to feel that much stronger. Um, that's the, all of my quick riffs on that question. <laughs> I would, I would say, so, I also feel like this is so, so, so important, not just in the co-working world, but in general. Um, treating people like human beings. Um, I, 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 I can't say it enough. I feel like I have to constantly remind myself of it enough, uh, often, but um, we get so easily into this mentality that we are business contacts and this is a business experience and we're, you know, you're my customer, I'm your, you know, provider and, and this is a business arrangement and the more that you can make it just not even thinking about the business side and just say, hey, we're people, right? We all have hopes and dreams. We all have to pay our damn taxes. We all don't understand how the healthcare system works. Like, we all have to eat. We all like beer or we don't like beer. We're trying to be healthier. You know, like, these are things that are universal human things. And, you know, you might have a person, and this is getting back to uh, the conversation we were having um, earlier when we were talking about Katie and, and her, the people that don't really talk to each other, you know, and every person has something that if you get them going, they will talk all day about it, right? And it could be like model model boats or something, right? Or, or 
or their dog or whatever it is, but like everyone has something that they, if you can tap into it, they care so much about that they will that they'll connect on it, right? And and they'll ask you about what you care about, you know, and um. And the more that you're able to find those ways to connect with people as human beings and not as customers, uh, not as members, but just, hey, we're two human beings. And so, you know, those people are human beings too, and let's be humans together. Um, the more real your community is going to be and the less forced a lot of this stuff is going to be as well. Because ultimately, you know, if, you, if people start to recognize, hey, we're people and we're people together and we're bonded around that fact, uh, then a lot of hard things start to get easier. Uh, and breaking bread is a great way to do that, right? Um, obviously, getting drinks together is a great way to do that. Uh, making a communal salad, uh, which has been huge for me in, in events that I've done. If you say, hey, you know, on this day, bring an ingredient, and we're going to make a big, big, big salad together, and, you know, we're all going to help, you know, chip in and do that. Um, you know, just little activities that give people ways to uh, forget that they're spending most of their day on their laptops and start to be people together in the same place. Cool. cool. Okay. All right, so we're at uh, five minutes after the hour. Uh, any other parting shots? Any other questions? Was this fun? Was, how, how was this for everybody? Was this good? Show me some thumbs up for those of us on video. Yeah? Awesome. Yeah. Jesus, great. Awesome. Uh, great. Well, Susan and I, uh, uh, we're really excited to do this call. Uh, it's the first thing we've done that's that's like this. Uh, maybe we'll do another one in the not too distant future. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to gear up for our next round of training for Cotivation, uh, which is at the end of this month. So if any of y'all are interested, talk to us about that. Uh, but really, uh, we're happy to talk about community building in general, so please uh, don't be shy. Reach out to us if you're interested. Uh, and um, thanks so much for joining us. We really didn't know who was going to show up, if anyone was going to show up, if it was going to work, how it was going to work, and, uh, and we really pulled it together. I think this was a fun conversation. Uh, so yeah. thanks so much for joining. Thanks. It's been really fun. It's nice to see your faces, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, had a good time, guys. Nice to see you, too. Thanks. All right. All right, you guys. Take care, guys. Thanks care. so much. And, uh, again, if you want to reach out to us, uh, Tony at nwc.co. That's Susan uh, at cotivation.co. Uh, and um, we'll be here for you. So hit us up. And uh, good luck right. building your communities. Continue being humans. All right. <laughs> okay, folks. Take care. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.